and welcome back. This week, we focused on Asian Americans, Latinas, and Latinos in American popular music. And we use that as a way of talking about cultural performance and cultural performances. So, in this lecture, four key issues. Number one, performance. We're going to introduce performance as a way of understanding cultural acts. Two and three are related terms, identity politics and politics of identity. You'll recognize these from Oliver Wong's article on Asian American hip hop. And fourthly, we, we're going to examine the relationship between grassroots cultural production and mass culture. So first of all, we can define performance as embodied acts that take place in time and space. So as we think about performance instead of texts, we're focusing on the material dimensions of culture. When we talk about acts being embodied, they take place because of and take on meaning within and looking at our physical bodies. When we think about performances, they take place at a specific moment. Performances happen. They don't float around in the ether. And they happen somewhere. So by thinking about performance as a way of understanding cultural acts, we're drawing our attention to who, what, where, when, and why cultural actions take place. We're understanding performance in terms of the entire context. So, that gives us a way of understanding identity politics as opposed to the politics of identity, which is, of course, an opposition we're borrowing from Oliver Wong, but using more widely to think about Asian American and Latina Latino identification in popular culture. So first of all, a quick definition of identity politics. This is a term that gets used and abused popularly, but we're, what, how we're going to focus on it is understanding identity politics as efforts to have an identity and identity-based perspectives recognized by mainstream audiences. So if we're thinking about our diagram of hegemony, identity politics we can understand as a bottom-up relationship of power, by which previously marginalized, disenfranchised, and invisible groups claim recognition from the dominant group. This is opposed to the politics of identity. The politics of identity we can define as how identity-specific language and representations get used to solidify constructions of difference. To be clear, being different is not the problem. The issue is when difference gets constructed from the outside in order to be the basis of exclusion or objectification. So to go back for a second to identity politics, we can see these sort of bottom-up efforts to be recognized in terms of what Paredes calls the politically efficacious potential of Latinidad on page 23. We can think about this in terms of what she calls hybridity, in terms of Tejano music as this uniquely hybrid form, or even Asian American rap from Oliver Wong's article. We can also see these issues of identity politics emerging in Oliver Wong's article on page 40, when he discusses Asian American panethnicity. Panethnicity, of course, being the term that talks about identifying within a race across ethnic differences to think about the political usefulness of organizing as a racial community. And in terms of the politics of identity, we can see the dynamic of how identity politics and the politics of identity oftentimes happen within the same moment or text or performance. In Deborah Wong's piece, when she talks about the sort of celebration that happens at the Asian American Music Festival versus the type of critical resistance that can emerge from it. So as you think about the politics of identity itself, we can see this, for example, on page four of Paredes' analysis of Selinidad, when she talks about how representations of Selina's body have been altered in order to fit a sort of standard of whiteness. We can also see this in Oliver Wong's article on Asian American rap, when he talks about the rapper Jin and the way that his own performances were constantly constrained by how people understood Asian Americans and how Asian American rappers were seen as not fitting the mold. So 
As we think about identity politics and the politics of identity together, we can understand this in terms of how identity can be related to the formation of subjectivity or to the creation of objecthood. Right? So again, we're bringing up the dynamics of subjecthood and objecthood that we originally went over in week three. And we're thinking about how Asian Americans, Latinas, and Latinos intervene in popular culture against the constant push towards objectification to instead find ways of constructing group subjectivity. So, as we think about subjecthood versus objectification, we of course have our terms from last week, Orientalism and Tropicalization. And this week, new terms have been introduced, Asian Americanism and Latinidad. So to draw a quick distinction between them, Orientalism and tropicalization have immediately recognizable meanings because of the way that they've been used as racial ideologies. Orientalism and tropicalization, as our scholarly articles have noted, have been very much used in order to objectify and devalue Asian and Asian Americans and Latinas and Latinos around the world. However, when we talk about Asian Americanness and Latinidad, these are much more contested terms that are unstable because the meanings of Asian Americanness and Latinidad are constantly being remade, not only from the outside, but also from the inside. So, as we think about the difference between Orientalism and tropicalization and Asian Americanness and Latinidad, we're thinking about the relationship between subject making and pure objectification. We're thinking about the usefulness of racial representation and racial identification because these are the terms that have been imposed on us. And of course, you remember the definition of Orientalism from last week, as well as the definition of tropicalization. So as we think specifically about, on the one hand, music, and on the other hand, space, we can think about the relationship between mass culture and grassroots cultural production. And you'll recognize these terms from the vertical hierarchy of culture. On the one hand, there's high aesthetic culture, and on the other hand, there's low popular culture, which we can understand both in terms of mass culture, which is the culture created by the culture industry for profit, and grassroots cultural production, which emerges organically from everyday people. We previously talked about how grassroots cultural production is constantly becoming appropriated by the culture industry for commodification and profit. But if we think about popular music forms, we can think about this in reverse, as well as we think if we think about the way that spaces get used. So for example, in Paredes' introduction to Selina Dutt, she talks about how Selina uh, subverted the gender norms that pervaded Tejano music as well as popularized what was very much a local form that was seen as being less valuable and less artistically creative than other musical forms. So in this way, we can understand her as finding success through this kind of weird jumble of mass culture and grassroots cultural production. In Oliver Wald's article, he talks about how Asian Americans use rap. On the one hand, it expresses a kind of grassroots perspective especially when he close reads the lyrics in terms of how they engage in a sort of social critique. But on the other hand, these Asian Americans are, uh, there's a question to be asked about how these Asian Americans come into the form, on the one hand through hip hop's popularization as mass culture, but on the other hand, the way that hip hop has historically been used to give voice to marginalized communities. We also see this in Deborah Wong's article on the Asian American Music Festival when she talks about how the festival reclaims city space. So in this way, kind of grassroots reappropriating public space that's constantly becoming privatized. And fourthly, we see this in the Outlier article by David Trujillo. In terms of how he talks about soccer games as a way of addressing how public spaces get used and by who. So in each of these examples from the scholarly articles, there's this type of tension between, on the one hand, 
uh, uses of mass culture, but also the grassroots uh, cultural production that's taking place kind of from within it. So what we can gather from looking at these uses of spaces and these uses of music together is this real attention to issues of production and audience, besides just issues of form and representation. And final point for this lecture is a continuation of a point from last week, thinking about authenticity as a racial project. And of course, you remember this definition of racial project. You should be familiar with it by now. So across the four different articles, the scholars discuss the way that authenticity and its associated ideas of talent and appropriateness and uh, belonging are each ways of drawing lines of inclusion and exclusion. In Oliver Wong's article, he immediately talks about this on page 36 in terms of how talent is actually a retroactive term used to justify the success of some over the failures of others. And on page 41, when he talks about authenticity and how Asian Americans are seen as inauthentic in hip hop, he talks about how these are not, even though these terms seem to be completely deracialized, they are very much racial. And there we can see the effects of them being racial projects. In Salinidad, by uh, Deborah Paredes, we can see this in terms of how Selena is described as a crossover artist. She does a very excellent analysis of the way that the idea of her being a crossover artist is very much racialized because Selena is in fact American born and raised. We see this in Deborah Wong's discussion of the Asian American Music Festival when she talks about a celebratory multiculturalism versus Asian American resistance. The issue of the racial project comes in when we think about for whom this sort of celebration happens and what the different expectations are in organizing this festival. And finally, we see this in David Trudeau's article in terms of who belongs and doesn't belong in the space, because even though the park that he does his ethnography in is a public park, as you can see in his analysis, there are very much uh, boundary lines, oftentimes along the lines of race, in terms of who should and should not be using that space and for what purposes. So even though race is never announced, we can see how these discussions of who belongs and who doesn't belong in the park are indeed racialized. Okay? So, take a small break. Next one's coming up. <laughs>